Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry, and today our guest is the program director of the Talaza Club, David Cabrera. They are a group with a mission to invigorate traditional fishing customs and cultivate informed ocean stewards of all ages. David, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You know, um, I was thinking that maybe we could start with... Uh, not the activities of your club, but what are the values really that brought you guys together mm. and kind of are driving what it is that Talaza Club is trying to accomplish? That's a great question. I, th- I think, um, you know, aside from our core values that are on the website, I, I think what is a common thread between myself and, and everybody involved in, in the development of the organization is that we all have our own special relationship with the ocean. Just like everybody on the island or in the Marianas has their own special relationship with the ocean. And I think what the Taladza Club as a whole is trying to do is trying to offer the public who maybe have not yet had their relationship with the ocean. And um, we're we're offering them that opportunity and, and in hopes that that special relationship with the ocean organically grows into a passion and a, and a desire to protect the ocean. I guess I've started the show assuming that everybody knows what a Talaza is, but (laughs) maybe not. What is a Talaza, and how did this Talaza net all of you guys together to form this club? The Talaza is a cast net. Um, It it opens up to a a circular shape, but it's a cast net that's weaved, um, and then it's weighted at the bottom, and then it pulls up to a cone shape. Um, It's used to do some shoreline fishing as well as fishing on the reef. And it must have been a group of pretty passionate people that have come together to form this relatively new nonprofit. How did this come about? So the Talaza Club started um, from a one-day workshop that I organized while I was employed for another prominent organization here in the CNMI, Friends of the Mariana Trench. The one-day workshop was designed to introduce and showcase the traditional fishing method of Talaza casting to youth ages 10 to 13. Uh, The response from that one-day workshop was just exceeding our expectations. The amount of enthusiasm and interest at that one-day workshop was very evident, even in the parents that dropped their kids off that day or just observers who wanted to come by and see what we were doing. Um, and then in recognizing that interest and, and demand, w- we knew right then and there that this should be a more comprehensive program, a more progressive program that included an emphasis on, on ocean stewardship and responsible fishing and conservation. How did you become a Talajeru? <laughs> uh, I'm not a master Talajeru. Uh, that is, I think that every Talajeru would say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, I've had the fortunate um, opportunity to learn from uh, people like Jeremiah Beneventi, who is our lead instructor and who comes from a family of Talajeru. So I think that the beautiful thing about learning to uh, use the Talaja is that oh, it doesn't matter how you learn in the beginning, but you, you, you start to develop your own personal style and technique. And, and I, I think that's what makes it an art. What kind of stood out to me when I was looking at your website and preparing for the show is really how much thought you've put into what you guys are doing. You have a curriculum and uh, with a number of components. I was hoping we could go through each of those sections and maybe you could share with us a little knowledge um, for our listeners as far as what this craft is all about and what it means as part of our culture and our life today. For example, the first component you talk about is called technical craft knowledge. 
what are we talking about here? So technical craft knowledge could be anything from how a talaza is made, the basics and the fundamentals of weight balance when you're holding the talaza and get, and preparing to, to cast it, to even just the, the nuances and the technique that you and you are using on your own um, that you uh, pull inspiration from what the instructor is, is teaching you. So um, what we do in that module is we take the somebody who maybe has never been introduced to the talaza to understanding all the parts of the talaza and how to carry its weight and use its weight as a, a, a momentum or leverage. Mm. Okay. Um, what about the seasonality of food fishes, right. which anybody who spends any time by the ocean here kind of and observes the fishermen, even though they may not fish themselves mm -hmm. uh, like I do, could kind of start to get an idea that, hey, there's certain times the fishermen come out. There's certain months. There's mm -hmm. certain times of the month. What's going on there with seasonality? Right. So certain species of fish have their own seasonal migration or movements or even growth um, in size. Uh, what we want to incorporate into the curriculum is all that information, including what times of the year, where they like to feed, maybe what times of day they like to feed, um, how that how the moon phases affect that, how the tide affects that. Yeah, can you tell us some and of that? Sure. So <clears throat> there's a specific um, phase of moon that tends to be uh, tends to yield the most uh, food for uh, yield the most fish of specific kinds. Um, typically, for tides, uh, you want to go out in the low tide. Uh, of the full moon and then watch the tide rise and watch the fish come in and watch them feed close to or adjacent to the channel openings on the shoreline um, once you start to observe things like that you're able to you're able to log your own experiences and then and then create your own schedule and system of when to go out and have the most catch Okay, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, maybe this is also a different species, but I thought somebody had said it's good to fish when it's a new moon. Yes, so the new moon and in, corp in, in corporation with the tides is when um, we like to go out, especially uh, at the peak of the low tide and then ri catch it rising. I was interested to learn that, and I don't know if this coincides also with the English names of fish, but... With Chamorro, uh, the Chamorro names of fish, there are actually different names for different ages of fish. Right. Like, I think maybe it's the skipjack, the ee. -E. Whatever the ee, -E, yeah. the ee -E becomes, number one in English, what is the, the species for the ee? -E? Oh, man, you're really putting me on the okay, spot. Okay, not the scientific I, name. <laughs> <laughs> the common name. Well, I, I, I may not be, I think that's a better question for our lead instructor. But Jeremiah, for, where are you? <laughs> yeah, please, where are you? But um, I, I've just called it ee -E my whole life. I know it's a type of trevally as it gets older. Okay. Um. But yeah, uh, so yeah, you're right. Certain species do have different names for different stages of their growth, like the E, for example, right? And um, and most jacks also do have different names for depending on on what stage they are in their growth. Yeah, good, good one, good question you got here. I have a lot of questions because <laughs> I, I watch the fishermen a lot. I don't yeah. actually fish, but it's interesting. Uh, one of the things we're gonna you, get you started. In oh, okay, great. <laughs> yes, I'm game. One of the things that you um, feel is really important for people to understand about your group and what you're trying to do is that you completely uh, recognize and incorporate and respect traditional knowledge, but you're mm -hmm. also conscious of our changing environment and ocean stewardship, as you said. Uh, what are some responsible fishing practices that you teach as part of your curriculum? Of course. So some of the basics include obviously just only catch what you need. Um, and then recognizing that if, it, if a fish is in its growth cycle where it's too small and it yields very little sustenance for you, you should let it go and let it grow and let it get to a stage in its life where it would provide more sustenance to you or your family or, or even to sell. So those are some of the basics that we teach um, in, in regards to 
uh, responsible fishing practices. What do you see among the fishermen of today as far as responsiveness to that kind of approach to fishing? I think in general, uh, any experienced fisher learns that on their own over time. But it always helps to learn it sooner at the start of your fishing career, let's call it. Um, and also to be aware of the bigger picture that your 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 responsible fishing practices are contributing to. So an experienced fisherman would already know to catch only what he needs or to let a fish go so it can grow. Um, but he's not necessarily thinking generationally, and that's sort of the principle that we want to include in our curriculums is that we teach young fishers to think generational and to think and to remember that um, in, order, in order for our future generations to survive, we've got to conserve and be responsible with our resources now. I think that may have been the first um, news article I saw about you guys was Mm. an outreach you were doing at American Memorial Park for the youth. Youth are really an important part of your program, correct? Absolutely. Uh, We we like to start them young. (laughs) I think that this collaboration that we did with American Memorial Park recently um, is the epitome of that. What American Memorial Park is doing is wonderful because they're allowing members of the community to, or just the general public, to come out and check out a talaza or even a rod and reel and a tackle box with the full kit and check it out for free for the day and, and practice. So um, they wanted to introduce that by uh, asking us to come out and facilitate a clinic um, to teach the basics and the fundamentals of Talaza so that these kids can come out with a certificate, take the certificate with them to American Memorial Park, check out the Talaza, and and, uh, and have already some working knowledge of it before they check it out. Is that program already available? It's available right now. You should uh, call the visitor center at American Memorial Park, talk to Ranger Brooke Nevitt or anybody else there. They'll be happy to help you. Awesome. That sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, We're talking today about the Talaza Club, and we'll be back with more after this break. In Northern Marianas Humanities Council, Bula Guinahanya Puri Historian Marianas Zan Kutura. Sinyon Soda SCC Hanan Futmashon Giz on Mami website, nmhcouncil.org. Pat Besita Gi YouTube, Pat Facebook. Guajaloku Diferentes Class in Le Blue Senior on Farm. The Northern Marianas Humanities Council has Uzura Todu e Experiencia and Tautau. Welcome back to your Humanities Half Hour. We are talking Talaza fishing today with the program director of the Talaza Club, David Carrera. David, uh, going back to some of the other components of the curriculum that your club is using, you also advocate the logging of uh, catch. What is the importance of fishing? management and and logging and how does this work where do people report to sure so we we advocate for individual logging um one that helps you understand what may be working for you on one session and not working for you in one session secondly that also helps with just the overall fishery management in our on our in our islands here um there's a an app I think that exists called Catch It Log It, which is mainly used for commercial fishermen, and it gives fishers the opportunity to log in their catch, the weight, where they caught it, what species of fish it was, and I think in general these these logging practices are crucial for uh, fishery management, um, whether it's for commercial or or just for us um, as indigenous people managing the resources of our waters. I was wondering if we could maybe get people's imagination flowing with, you know, people who walk along the beach. What are some of the fish that they might spot Mm -hmm. that a taladero would be going after? Um, If you could describe them and then maybe describe how they're eaten. Ooh, okay. So uh, this most recent clinic we had with American Memorial Park, we were make, we were having kids look out for some activity near these patches of seaweed or near and around these patches of seaweed at Micro Beach. And we were, we were asking the kids to try to spot some movement coming from right on the surface of the water and then coming close to the sand. 
and we and we told them that that might either be ee or tl i don't know if you've heard of those fish before yes. but those are really good eating right and then so before we even have them cast the net that's one thing we have them do is kind of walk up and down the beach try to observe try to see if they spot any fish behavior and from there, once they spot uh, a grouping of fish, like f in this last session, um, some kids spotted some EE, -E, they casted their net, they caught it, and then the next day, one of the rangers, Ranger Nat, brought in some Keleguin that was made from that fish they caught the previous day. So that was pretty cool to watch. But on the first day after they caught it, immediately after they caught it, they got to see how to clean the fish. So descaling it, gutting it, and then keeping it in a cool in a cool place until until you're able to prepare it. So that's that's um that's one of the things we try to incorporate into the clinics is uh, talk about the ways you can prepare the fish that you catch. And uh, I don't know about you, but I love Kelleguin, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, th I think that's a definitely a favorite for catching these, uh, for eating these small fish caught yeah. with the uh, uh, taladza. EE -E and TL, those, those make really good killing one, yeah. I also have noticed that there seem to be larger taladzas mm -hmm. being used today. Yeah. So the larger diameter taladzas with the larger net, w uh, net holes um, tend to be used more so on the reef uh, to catch fish like uh, palaxi, tatega, or uh, sometimes even mafuti or tarakitu on, on the reef, you know. Um, that takes a little bit more experience and also a little bit more care because uh, the nature of it means that you have to walk on the reef, so you need to understand what kind of potential damage the weight of your net is causing on the reef, how to properly walk around the reef, and um, you learn that further into the curriculum at the Talaza Club. Would that be under your component called preservation conservation techniques or methods? It, it's tied in for sure. It's tied in for sure because we definitely have to keep track of the kind of impact we're making on the reef as the reef is, is an important aspect of the ecosystem as a whole. So it, it does tie in for sure. What are some of the other things you teach under that component for preservation and conservation? For preservation and conservation, we talk about some of the tools that exist for conservation. So things like sanctuaries and monuments, and we we give we want to provide the students with enough information to make decisions on their own and be be individual thinkers. So we like we want to provide the facts about what these tools, how these tools may benefit, how these tools may hinder, if at all, but. We try to explain the difference between what a sanctuary is and how a san or and a monument and how a sanctuary can be used and um, the existing sanctuaries in our on our in our islands here. So we try to incorporate all of that. What is the response you're getting from, especially the kids that are participating in your, in your activities? In general, the kids just want to get on the sand and start throwing the talas <laughs> out. <laughs> Understandable. Right? And then secondly, I, I think that once they, once they experience um, the, the satisfaction of seeking out fish activity and then catching a fish, I think they're absolutely hooked, right? No pun intended. They're absolutely mm -hmm. hooked. And they wanna they wanna improve their skill. They wanna hone in their skill. And for the most part, every every clinic or workshop that we've put together, uh, they they're interested in wanting to do another one. So it's evident after every workshop that this is definitely something we should prov be providing for the community and from the parents too. You know, the kids aren't aren't the only ones excited. Yeah. When you guys talk about group stewardship, what are you working towards with that? Sure. So it's we want to incorporate some uh, some teamwork, some 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 activity that uh, encourages group solidarity. Um, I think a, a big ocean steward project that we we require as part of the curriculum. And we always we we de we decided to leave it up to the cohort to to determine what their group stewardship project is going to be, but we wanted to offer our 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 students an opportunity to make an impact outside of themselves. I think that um, we want to encourage 
people uh, being community minded and I think requiring a group stewardship project is, is a way to do that. Well, it sounds like you definitely have a group of committed people mm-hmm. who are putting a lot of time into this group. What is it you um, have coming up or you're looking forward to or your next goal that's on your list? Wow. So w- we might have some some lofty goals as, as, a th- as the club. And I know... You hear Taladza Club and you think, oh, maybe it's just a group of Taladzeros or Taladzeras, right? But that's kind of what I thought initially. <laughs> but we until I saw your website, <laughs> right, 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 yeah. We we want to make a bigger impact. We we want to make impact with um, depth, as like a friend once said. And I think the way we do that is we seek out innovative programs or projects that align with the overall mission, the overarching mission that Taladza Club has. And our vision at Taladza Club is resource conscious communities. So um, in alignment with that, some of our the programs that we're seeking out are along the lines of fishery management. So we've submitted grant proposals for an online fishery management course that we want to have free and available to the public. Uh, programs like an uh, a sustainable fisher certification program um uh an app where uh a, or an e- a commerce app where somebody fishing could take a picture of their fish and somebody else could see that fish and immediately make a bid and and purchase or meet that per- person to purchase um we've got a lot cooking uh we uh, we're trying to do the most we can with um, the little resources we have and we are doing the most we can with the little resources we have but uh, we can only do so much so we're still trying to apply for grants (laughs) always a good idea yes do you have any particular activities coming up on your calendar for youth or adults yeah we have a few coming up Uh, we have an upcoming project with uh, CHCC Public Health Services um they're they're working on the Let's Move Marianas project, and they want to incorporate some cultural aspect of that into their program. So we might be facilitating a the Laza Cast and Cook Clinic with uh, Public Health, where we incorporate a the Laza session and then cooking, uh, utilizing a healthy recipe after we catch. If we catch, hopefully we catch. <laughs> if pick, not, we'll bring a cooler. Pick the right moon phase yeah, and the exactly. right time of the day. <laughs> and then another project we've got coming up is um, I, I just actually introduced it to all the PSS middle school and high school students or principals uh, for a marine science project contest. Uh, that's It's an opportunity for kids to explore uh, projects in the marine science field and hopefully that inspires them to pursue marine science careers Mm. in the future. For the average person um, who may not be a fisherman but they go to the beach or they're in the water or maybe they're a marine sports operator but probably not going to fish, what tips could you give us um, that would be maybe common things you see that, that are being done that shouldn't be done or things that could be done that aren't being done? For the average beachgoer, how could they help sustain mm-hmm. uh, the species of these species of fish that are caught with the talaza? So I think f- first and foremost, it may not seem like you're making a direct impact, but leave your water bottles or just don't use wa- reusable, I mean, uh, disposable plastic water bottles. Bring a reusable water container and, and try to stay away from plastics. The The least amount of, I mean, the less plastic we can, we, we use is the, le- is the, is less plastic out in the ocean. So first of all, do that. Secondly, try to leave the beach with more than what you came with. So if you're at the beach and you see some trash on the shoreline, pick up a, a couple pieces. I know you're not going to be able to clean it all by yourself, but pick up a couple pieces, throw it in the bin on your way out, and try to leave the beach cleaner than it was when you got there. I think that'll help. And, and you may not see it, but it is helping. 
I'm sure you have some uh, partners other than American Memorial Park that you've worked with. Who's um, who are some of your supporters? And if people are interested, how can they support you? Sure. Yeah. So fortunately, we've we've um, received a lot of support from private citizens as well as some businesses like uh, Bridge Capital and Tonham Writing and Design. Um, we've also received some donations from local community leaders, which we really appreciate. Uh, there's multiple ways you can help. You can, first of all, you can fill out the community survey that is on our website, taladzaclub.org. If you fill out that survey, you'll help us collect some data and um, we'll have a stronger application when we apply for grants. Uh, the other way you can help is obviously monetarily. We have a PayPal set up. Um, you can email us at taladzaclub at gmail.com to coordinate that so we can make sure you get your receipt. Um, and then spread the word. We're, we're here and, and we're here to stay because our mission requires it. We want to reinvigorate traditional fishing methods and cultivate informed ocean stewards of all ages. So spread the word. We're at taladzaclub.org and we're also on Instagram at, at taladzaclub. We're working on a Facebook, but we're not quite there yet. <laughs> we know we're missing out on a big audience. <laughs> yeah, the older generation you're going to find you us said on it, Facebook. I didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> David, thanks so much for your knowledge and your time today. Any final thoughts before we go? Uh, I do want to mention that there are some key figures that really propelled the Taladza Club from its earliest days to now and I, I mentioned Jeremiah Beneventi but he is critical in, in the Taladza Club he's our lead instructor master Taladzeru he's an experienced educator and, and he brings so much to the Taladza Club and most of it on a volunteer basis then we have our board of directors uh, Jolene Salas Jessalyn Kitanu uh, Alexis Hofschneider and Ed Manibus and I think without these passionate and driven individuals um we would definitely not have not gone as far as we have. So thank you for having us. Our guest today has been David Cabrera. He's the program director of the Talaza Club. And if you're interested in supporting them or getting more information, you can find them online at talazaclub.org. This has been your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry. This program was supported by a We the People grant awarded to the Northern Marianas Humanities Council from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Humanities Council.